Well, hello, and thanks so much for joining us online this weekend. We are starting a brand new series called The Realistic Rhythms of Grace. This is going to be a six-week series, and and it's really exciting because we're going to look at Lent. Now, what you may or may not know is there's this thing called the church calendar. For centuries, the church has been following this all around the world. Now, some churches and some denominations follow it very, very closely, and every year they do it. And others, not so much. We, we jump in and out. We tend to be on the ladder. We follow it, but not tightly. But, but the idea of the church calendar is to set rhythms for us that give us an anticipation and a preparation for the things of our faith and the different seasons of our faith. In other words, there's rhythms to our faith. One of those, one of those is Lent. Lent is starting February 14th, which also happens to be Valentine's Day this year, and is going to lead us all the way through Easter. Now, maybe you come from a tradition and a background where Lent is very familiar to you, and you're like, yes, I know it, and I love it, and I can't wait for this. Maybe you come from a background where you were like, yeah, I know it, and man, that just it feels too like uh, liturgical, or it feels maybe too of a Catholic background, or maybe... Maybe you've never heard of Lent before at all. And you're like, that's the stuff that I get out of my dryer. Like, what what is this thing? I, I don't want any of us to be intimidated or scared by this. Because Lent is a fairly simple concept where we implement purposefully intentional rhythms into our life. Lent is a time where followers of Jesus remember and prepare for both the grief and the celebration of Good Friday and the resurrection of Easter. It's a time for us to focus intentionally, to self-reflect on spiritual renewal through the rhythms of our faith. Rhythms like repentance and fasting, which we're going to talk about next week, and and prayer and charity, which are going to come in this. And by the way, if you've gone through Rooted, then you're going, wait a minute, these are rhythms that I'm already familiar with. And I go, exactly. These are just rhythms of being a good follower of Jesus. And this entire series is really an invitation. It's an invitation to a life following after Jesus, inspired by the Spirit. You see, the moment Jesus shows up on the earth, God in the flesh, what we call the incarnation, there's an invitation to those who have trusted in Jesus, or rather trusted God. You see, Israel, these people that have trusted God forever, They need to reorient their life and their expectations to who God really is, which is Jesus. And there's this invitation to those that are both far from God to encounter him. And and there's an invitation to those that are maybe close to God to encounter him in a new way and not just the versions that they have heard or that people have made up about him. Now, one of the places that we see an invitation to Jesus comes in Matthew chapter 3. Now, in Matthew chapter 3, this is an account of Jesus' life. And Matthew gives the backstory, because every good like story has a backstory, right? And so in chapter 1, you have the bloodline. Uh, the bloodline is, is the, the genealogy of Jesus, the birth of Jesus, and everything that happens there. In chapter 2, we see his early childhood and a couple of events that happen when he's a young boy. And then chapter three, there's a time jump where we kind of do the like, if you could take chapter one and chapter two is like flashback to set up the story. Then chapter three jumps forward to where Matthew goes, okay, now things get going. And it's a time when Jesus is an adult. And as adult, he begins his public ministry as Jesus the Christ. But before he begins, there's one guy who's been preparing the way long before Jesus shows up and begins preaching. This guy is John the Baptist. You can see an icon of him here. John the Baptist is out in the wilderness. So he's close to the major cities, but he's out in like not even the suburbs. He's, he's rural. And he had one message, one main premise that he wanted everybody to know. And that was to repent. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, I think you and I hear that word repent and, and we hear like, oh, yeah, like, like, like that's a churchy word. Like, like that's a judgy word. Like other people tell me to repent. Like John the Baptist, like, no, no, thank you. Right, right. And there's a lot that needs to be said about repentance and more will be said about that in a moment. But, but I want to admit that sometimes we hear that word and we have an aversion to it. But then the other thing we maybe hear is, yes, yes, absolutely repent. 
but, but there's an implied or understood subject in that repentance. Now, maybe it's been a moment since you took English class, right? An implied subject at the beginning when there is no subject, there is you, right? And so we hear repent and it's like, yeah, you repent. Like, I know others that need to repent. Like, you need to repent, not me. Like, I know family, I know friends, I've got frenemies, I've got kids, I've got Jerry Jones for like re-signing Mike McCarthy. Like, there's some things people need to repent of, right? But me? Me? No, 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 I'm, I'm good. It's, it's an implied you, not an implied me. And so that's what can be a little bit scary, but also maybe sobering to go, gosh, God, maybe you have something for me to repent of. In the story we're going to see in a minute, there's two groups of people that are coming to John the Baptist. And there's people from Jerusalem and Judea, those cities that are nearby, those regions there. And they're coming and they're repenting. And then there's the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees are, are people that are the religious kind of uh, leaders of the day. And they're people that also need to repent. And so you can see like two kinds of people, the people from the city and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and both groups need to repent. There's two groups that are there. Now, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, these are two groups of men that have been following God and, and thinking about following God and the desires of God. And so they're coming going, hey, we have a lot of theological background. And so when they get word that there's an untrained, uncouth, unkept guy out in the wilderness calling people to repent, which is something they feel like they should be calling people to, but it's not for them, it's only for others. They come and, and got to go check it out. So they gather together and here's Matthew chapter three, starting in verse one. And those days, John the Baptist came into the wilderness of Judea proclaiming, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. For he is the one about whom the prophet Isaiah has spoken. The voice of one shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make his path straight. Now John wore clothing made from camel, camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and a diet that consisted of locusts and wild honey. The people from Jerusalem came and as well as all of Judea and the region around the Jordan were going out to him. And he was baptizing them in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you offspring of vipers, talk about a, not a very warm welcome, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, therefore produce fruit that proves your repentance. And don't think that you can say to yourselves, oh, no, no, no we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God can raise up children for Abraham from the very stones around us. Even now the ax is laid at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. You see, I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one coming after me is more powerful than I am. In fact, I'm not even worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clean out his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the storehouse. But the chaff he will burn up with the inextinguishable fire. Now, there's a lot to try to unpack in this text. And so I, I want to unpack just a little bit of it. So, so let's back up a little bit. You see, Matthew starts out reminding us who John is. And then just as in the Old Testament, it declared that there would be a Messiah, a savior, a king from the line of David that would come. And he's covered that in Matthew chapter one with the genealogy. So also the Old Testament says in the book of Isaiah, that there is one who's going to come before Jesus. And this is John the baptizer. And so people are, are coming to him. He's calling them to repentance and he is baptizing them in water there in the Jordan River, which is why he gets the nickname, John the Baptist. You see, the Baptist is, is not his last name. It's a nickname. So he's in a long line of people we've done this to think like Vlad the Impaler, Andre the Giant, Chance the Rapper. You, you get the point, right? And so John is there. And again, there's, there's two groups of people that are coming, right? Those that are there in the surrounding cities and region that understand their lowly place and their need for repentance. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees who are leaning on their heritage and what's happened in the past rather than letting God continue to move them in the present. 
So these two groups of people, you have one leaning in and one lording over. One admitting their need and confessing their rebellion. And one shaming and cynical and poking holes and pointing fingers. One repenting. One resisting. Which begs the question, well, then what is repentance? And that's a, it's a huge question, I know. And it's a huge question because I think it's one we have to ask ourselves. You see, one of the things that I've realized longer and longer I follow Jesus is that I am more and more inclined to become like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. To just go, wait, look, look, but look at all that I know and all that I have. And, and God, I've walked with you in the past for so long and, and I have this heritage and I have all of these things. And so now let me look at other people and the world around them and let them know how they need to repent without ever really looking at me and going, God, how are you calling me to repentance? Lent is all about letting the Holy Spirit come in, examine us and lead us to repentance. And it's a really simple three-step process. And the first step of Lent is that repentance is first an inward movement. It's something that begins inside. Maybe you would call that conviction or your conscience or a nagging or a longing or a Jiminy Cricket. The scripture would call it the Holy Spirit. Something on the inside. You've probably had that moment that moment where you've done something or you've said something and they're, they're just, it's like it's in your heart and it just goes, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And in that moment, you have a choice. Do you listen to that prompting or do you ignore it? Do you pay attention to it or do you not pay attention to it? You see, all throughout scripture, God has called his people to repentance uh, sometimes God uses a prophet. Sometimes God uses an angel. Sometimes God uses a tragedy. There's even one occasion where he uses a donkey. So, so like God can call us to repentance all sorts of ways. And there is maybe an outside entity that's calling it to us, but it's always the Holy Spirit doing the work in us that we have to listen to. You see, I have moments like this. I bet you do too. You've probably got like a friend that comes to you and calls you out on something. For, for me, it's often my wife. My wife is the one that can look at me and go, hey, what you're doing is unhealthy. That thing you're engaging in, the way you're saying, the way you're carrying yourself, it's not good. You see, often other people outside call it out in us because others can recognize our patterns of, of unhealth before we see them ourselves or maybe before we're willing to admit them. And so there's people in my life that I've given permission and sometimes I haven't and they do it anyway and that's good for me to call me out. But you know what happens so often when that comes? I don't listen. I don't listen to them. Why? Because no human being can really convict me. Oh, I can hear what they have to say, but there has to be an inward movement in me, a willingness to receive what they're saying. You see, often what happens is I listen to them, but I'm not willing to hear what they're saying. And oftentimes, in that moment, I can't even hear what they're saying because my pride won't allow me. But the way it tends to work in my life, and maybe you can relate to this, is the words stay with me. The words that the friend says or the words that my wife say stay with me. And then there comes a moment later of silence, of solitude, of prayer where I'm seeking after the things of God and spending time reading his scripture and, and just praying and going, God, would you speak to me? And that's when the Holy Spirit breaks in and brings back the words that someone said. The Spirit goes, dude, she's right. Own up to what your wife has said. Own up to what your friend, own up to what your colleague has said. And it's in that moment that on the inside, repentance has begun. But it's hard because this is the part that we don't often see. In fact, I'd say it's almost impossible to see it. It's subtle. It's sometimes just this little still small voice. Now, yes, sometimes it's drastic and, and there's a huge shift that happens inside us, but normally it's just by a degree or two. But there's always a choice. And we see that in this text. The crowd is coming and they are choosing to submit themselves. The Pharisees, they're not leaning in. They're lording over. 
It's this moment of choice. You know, one of my, my first mentors in, in ministry is a guy named Jason Goings. And I, I'll never forget one Sunday, Jason talking about this idea. And he said, when, when that inner conviction begins in you, it's like all of a sudden a giant door was poured, put in front of you. And it's this door of, of leaning in and walking towards God. And it's, it's a huge door that because you feel the conviction in this inner movement, like you can open the door and step right through it and receive the grace on the other side. But because we're so afraid of that, what we do is end up making excuses. Oh yeah, yeah I see the door, but I mean, it's not that bad. Like well, what I did wasn't, wasn't that terrible. You know, I mean, they're going to get over it. I didn't mean to. I was only joking. Well, well, they, whatever they did, here's what they did that caused me to do that. You, gosh, we just end up convincing ourselves not to walk through the giant door in front of us. We deflect. And I'll never forget, he said, what happens in that moment is the door shrinks. The door gets smaller. Yeah, I mean, it's still, I can walk through it. It's, it's still okay, but, but I've still got my excuses and I've still got my pride and I'm not willing to humble myself and raise my hand and say, hey, I, I've messed up here because I don't want to seem, be seen as a failure and the door gets smaller and smaller and now I've got to stoop through. And he said, and then eventually the door is so small that we just look at it and go, there's no way I can walk through that. And we walk away completely. And we've removed ourselves from this moment that God was trying to grow the character of him in us. And we forget that the door was even there. And that is until we do the thing again and we get called out again and then the door gets big again. There's a choice. What will we do with that inner conviction? Will we pay attention to it? Will we listen to it? Will we like the crowd coming to John the Baptist say, yes, I need to do this. Or will we be like the Pharisees that just walk? away. During Lent, it's a season where we purposefully position ourselves for moments of fasting and listening, seeking the spirit to say, God, would you be the one to convict me? And I know that can sound super scary, but I want you to know it is healthy and it is helpful because when you do that, you begin to find freedom. But we have to say yes to the inner movement that God is doing. But then there's that second step of repentance, right? After the inner movement, well, then we understand that repentance is verbal. Re repentance is verbal. Like, like there's something about opening the door and walking through it that is saying it out loud. Now, the, the, the traditional word we would use around this is the word confession. And we're going to do an entire sermon in this series on confession. And so I'm, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that today. But this is the moment where apologizing comes in. And I mean like truly apologizing, not the like, hey, I'm sorry, but fill in the blank. As soon as you say a but, like the apology doesn't matter, right? No, no, hey, I was stressed or life was busy or I was hangry at the time. Like those are all excuses. That's not an apology, right? They all may be true, but it's not owning up to what you've done, to admitting out loud that you've done something that you hurt someone. When we come to that moment of saying out loud the thing that we know we've been convicted of, I want you to know that it's bravery, it's not failure. And often, by the way, the person we're saying it to, whether it's somebody in our life or it's just God himself, they already know. They're not surprised by it. It's comforting to them that we're actually admitting it out loud. It shows movement. And so we can say it out loud and apologize to the people around us, but often it starts with just saying it out loud to God and saying, God, I am sorry. And I would even submit that often both of those things are needed. And so there's an inward movement and then there's the verbal acknowledgement, but then there's step three, where repentance is action. This is what John is calling the Pharisees out for. He sees them coming and he's going, look, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. You seem to be coming to like watch what's happening in here, but you need to come and repent. You cannot come and judge other people for the inner parts that God is moving in them and the outward action that they're doing by being baptized in the Jordan when you yourselves are not willing to do it. You can't even say out loud the thing that you know you need to say out loud. And so he calls them to their actions. He says, I need to see change in your actions of this. 
In other words, he's looking at them and saying, I don't see fruit in your life. Getting in the water, letting me dunk you, like, although that may be kind of fun, and I might, if you're a Pharisee or a Sadducee, hold you down for just a little bit longer, just to really prove the point, like, like it doesn't work. Like, like, that's nothing if there hasn't been an inward movement and an apologizing to the people that you've been lording your religion over. There needs to be an inward change, an outward confession, but without action, it does not last. And that's the hardest part, right? I mean, if I'm in life with someone and how do they know when I've repented or how do I know when they have? Well, I would say we can't fully know, but part of the way is by long-term ongoing change of action. That ongoing change of action shows that the thing they said out loud, they really meant because there was truly an inner movement in them. Now, now the, the thing about this is if I'm in relationship with someone and they're coming to me in repentance, I then have to be willing to extend grace to them and understand that what we're asking for is not perfection, not no longer making mistakes, but a consistency over time. This is why anytime a massive public figure fails in some way and they offer their apology, we can kind of see through the words now and like, like that's fake. They didn't mean it. There wasn't an inward movement. They're just trying to do a PR stunt. But then we step back and we go, time will tell. We will see over time whether this was real. You know, in our yard at home, we have a crab apple tree. Uh, the crab apple tree is good for, for a lot of different things. It's good for, for climbing. It's good for uh, the kids to play around. It's good for attracting a few deer in our yard here and there. It's, it's the kids, like even my kids like to go and eat the apples to it. They're a little too bitter for me, but whatever, each to their own. I get it, right? But, but when I look at that crab apple tree, I can tell that it is mainly healthy. It's mainly healthy, and I see that by the fruit. There are apples that are on there that are mostly healthy. Now, there's one or two of them that are bad apples, right? Some end up getting rotten, some are misshapen, some we pull off and they've got worms in them. But, but I look at the tree and I see more good fruit than bad fruit. And so I can see that the tree is healthy. But if there's ever a moment that season after season, I begin to see that there's more bad fruit than good fruit, then I, it's an outward sign that there is something inwardly unhealthy with the tree. Maybe it's an internal problem. Maybe it's roots. Maybe it has an infestation. Maybe it's not getting the nutrients. I don't know. I'm, I don't know that much about trees, but I can figure it out. But then over time, the apples should, if I course correct, get healthy again. They're an outward sign that there's something ongoing there. This is our actions. The actions are, there's an inward thing that I'm realizing is rotten in me and I need to say that out loud. And then the people around us get to wait and see, is there going to be good fruit that comes from this? Not perfection, but consistency over time. And so those are the three steps of repentance. If you were to study this from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Now, now I told you there was kind of three movements or three steps of repentance and they can all happen very quickly, but there's always one goal. There is always one goal. And that is that repentance is relational reconciliation. You see, the goal of repentance is not just for me to become a better person. Right? I, I, I can do that and still keep people at arm's length. No, it's to come in and build relationship back. This again is what John is calling out the Pharisees and the Sadducees for. He's going, look, I see, wait, 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 wait. you seem to come wanting this repentance, but there's inner parts of you that you haven't dealt with yet. And there's relational reconciliation that needs to happen. And so Come and repent if it's genuine and an inner movement, but we're going to watch over time for the fruit because that's how you're going to have relational change with us. In other words, God knows the heart. You see, all you and I can do is look at the outside of ourselves, but God sees the heart. And it's always about maintaining a relationship with God and with each other. So what does this all have to do with the season of Lent? Well, Lent is a season of repentance and renewal. 
It's an invitation for you and I to engage in the spiritual practices. And instead of waiting to get caught or that thing to happen or someone to say something that God then used, it's a time of opening ourselves up to God for the inner conviction and saying, God, would you come and examine me? And would you show me the giant door I can walk through in repentance? You see, repentance is not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing thing. Again, that's what the Pharisees and the Sadducees missed, right? They were living off of the past. That's that little bit in there about, but but we're descendants of Abraham. We're Abraham's sons. And John goes, oh, if that was all that it was, God could call up stones right now for that. No, this is about an inward movement of the heart that you need to admit out loud and you you need to repent from just like the crowds are doing. Lent does that for us. We have a choice to lean into it. It's why we've called this series a realistic rhythm of grace. That when we walk through this door and we step into repentance, God has more grace for us. I want you to know God's grace never runs out. Nothing you ever do is going to surprise him. When you come to him in repentance, God, oh my gosh, God, I'm so sorry. I messed up. God tends to go, yeah, I I know. I'm I'm so sorry, God. I I, I didn't mean to do it. I I know. God, I'll never do it again. Yeah, you will. And there's more grace for you in that. The goal is not to mess up ever again. The goal is to repent so we stay in healthy relationship with God. That's the beauty of our relationships is that we can stay in them. Repentance allows us to do that. A lack of repentance Well, that distances ourselves from others and from God. It's why it's ongoing. Martin Luther once said that the life of the Christian should be one marked by repentance. So that's the invitation this season. And I know that may sound scary, but I want you to know, I believe it is sacred. So will you say yes to the invitation of repentance this season? If so, I want to encourage you to join us with the the curriculum that we've written, uh, these daily devotions that you can grab and and go through to just kind of create a rhythm of going, God, examine me here. Let me spend time with you. I want to encourage you to to tune in next week as we look at fasting or maybe visit one of our campuses so that you can do this face-to-face in community with people. The door is open. Would you be willing to walk through it this season? Let's pray together. Father God, I'm so thankful for the story of John the Baptist and his call to repentance. And so just as he was getting the people ready for you, God, would we take Lent seriously this year and get ready as well? Holy Spirit, would you be near to people? Would you be the comforter, the counselor, and the convictor? God, we thank you for the grace upon grace that you have. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray this. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online today. I hope you enjoyed the beginning of this series. And like I said, it's going to continue for six weeks. Don't shy away from the season of Lent. I believe God's going to do some amazing things in you, in me, and in our church if we lean into this season. We'll see you next time.